much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to the organizers for the introduction, and I'm also grateful to the Canada Research Chairs Program for the support they have provided to my Canada Research Chair in Globalization and Cultural Studies. Today's talk introduces the work of the research team Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange, Developing Transnational Literacies. This program is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to develop partnership research and practices based on reciprocal knowledge exchange to facilitate the teaching of English as an emancipatory literacy practice in local and global contexts. The talk will introduce the interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and transnational team, our goals, theories, and preliminary findings. Transnational literacies combine global consciousness with the skill sets, competencies, and performances suitable for full participation in the knowledge society. They include enhanced capacity for the co-creation of knowledge and adaptability to changing circumstances, the ability to exercise multi-level citizenship and innovate successfully as circumstances change. Vocational and technological education increasingly require not only knowledge of the English language, but also the reading strategies afforded by developing critical, digital, and transcultural literacies through instruction in English. For English to serve emancipatory literary goals, the balance between regulation and emancipation in education needs to shift. As suggested by de Souza Santos, it needs to shift to enable greater diversification in curricular choice and pedagogical strategies and a move away from norms associated with the native English speaker. So understanding what emancipation means also needs to shift. It's not a gift from teacher to student, from those who know to those who do not know. Instead, emancipation is a process of finding autonomy through reciprocal learning, in which there is no standard formula and for which there is no final conclusion. Learning is a lifelong process. Deregulation also needs to be handled with care. It's a favorite word for neoliberals. We need state regulation of education, but these regulations also need to become more flexible and open to other ways of knowing. So, who are we in the Brazil-Canada team? Our project builds on the partnership between the Center for Globalization and Cultural Studies at the University of Manitoba, which I direct, and the National Curriculum Project in English New Literacies, Novos Letramentos, at the University of Sao Paulo, directed by Valkyria Montemor and Lynn Mario Menezes de Souza. This Montemor Menezes de Souza initiative was launched in 2009 in relation to implementation of the new national foreign language teaching curriculum in Brazil, which they published in 2006. This redesigned curriculum enables greater teacher agency in adapting instruction to student needs and local interests. The national project was launched in response to the demands that such a curriculum places on teachers. Members meet each year to report on their local subgroup initiatives working with local teachers. For effective implementation, the revised curriculum requires building teacher capacity and confidence through partnering with local universities, a project that takes time and trust to develop. So this first slide lists the members 
uh, the partner universities in this voluntary project. And the next slide will show their distribution across Brazil. From this core then, the Brazil Canada Knowledge Exchange partners with colleagues at several universities in Canada and other universities in Brazil, the State University of Mato Grosso do Sul, the Federal University of Alagoas, Federal University of Sergipe, and APLIEMS, the Association of English Teachers of Mato Grosso do Sul. So our partnership is transsectoral, linking in-service and pre-service teachers and university teacher researchers. It is transgenerational, linking students, trainees, and teachers. It is interdisciplinary, bringing colleagues who work in education, applied linguistics, political studies, and English language and literature together. It's obviously transnational, linking partners in Canada and Brazil, but also, importantly, it is transregional, linking people in different parts of each country with people from other regions. So this research project is an experiment in which we are learning from our mistakes and learning to improvise our solutions. So we held our second Brazil-Canada team meeting together with some Novos Letramentos partners at the Federal University of Sergipe in Aracaju last week. This involved workshops for local teachers and students, student presentations on their work, and panels featuring Brazilian and Canadian academics in dialogue. And many of these can be viewed on the web and accessed through the Center for Globalization and Cultural Studies website or on Vimeo and YouTube. So our goals in the Canada-Brazil Knowledge Exchange. One, to strengthen transnational literacy and cross-cultural understanding within and between Brazil and Canada. Two, to work with English teachers and teachers in training to integrate theory and practice, developing site-specific pedagogies appropriate to global challenges. Three, to advance understanding of how globalization is impacting education at all levels in Canada and Brazil. Four, to advance the Brazil-Canada relationship. Five, to contribute to understanding of how to make transnational interdisciplinary partnerships work. And we think this will involve developing an epistemology and a methodology for working transnationally. So our framework, each of these goals has been developed within the larger frame of decolonial and postcolonial goals of education for developing critical forms of learning and ethical citizenship practices. We believe in the importance of strengthening the capacity of the system of education as a whole, rather than encouraging distinctions between elite and marginalized institutions. We're concerned with strengthening literacy at a time when there are pressures toward narrowing its focus to solely instrumental purposes. With Yata Kanu, we recognize that curriculum is a social practice. While education has always operated in tension between its regulatory and emancipatory functions, we want to tilt that balance toward the emancipatory, but also beyond it, toward developing individual autonomy for critical collective practices. We agree with Jane Fenway and Joanna Fahey that students need to understand where and how they are situated in knowledge if their learning is to be meaningful for them. With Colin Langshire and Chris Bigham, we think the proper role of schooling is to keep the future open for young people, not to close it off. And like them, we're trying to develop a mindset that's able to re-perceive schooling, teaching, 
literacy and new technologies in creative ways. With Simon Margenson and Erlen Wati Sawir, we think this kind of transformative educational practice will involve reciprocal intercultural engagement and a recognition that language is the door to agency. To encapsulate these recognitions, we have turned to Gayatri Spivak's theorization of transnational literacy for our initial inspiration. So what are transnational literacies and why do they matter? Spivak's theory is complex. She rejects neoliberal assumptions about instrumentality while retaining a belief that an education and critical thinking holds strong transformative potential. We want to hold on to the radical edge of Spivak's thinking by pushing the contemporary emphasis on skills beyond mere competency into the higher order meaning-making potential of 21st century literacy. And these forms of literacy are just as important for vocational and technical training as they are for more academic work. So we use transnational literacies as an umbrella term for the meaning-making interpretive strategies that we need to make sense of the contemporary world. We're looking at English teaching in local and global contexts to build learning cultures that can deal with the question of how readers negotiate meaning in contexts where norms of understanding diverge and where practices of reading and writing are being transformed through digital media. Both literacy and transnationalism carry complex histories. Norms of understanding work within cultural, historical, linguistic, regional, and social contexts. Digital engagements complicate the situation further. To pluralize literacy is to recognize that older and often ethnocentric notions of literacy are being challenged by technological changes and decolonizing initiatives. So literacy in the plural acknowledges the many ways people make meanings. In pluralizing literacy, we link our work to the cognitive justice movements associated with Latin American decolonial thinking and their critique of what Walter Mignolo has called the oppressive and Eurocentric dimensions of colonial modernity. So what does cognitive justice mean? What could it mean? We don't know, we're learning as we go, but we think it starts with a respect for many forms of knowing and many ways of making meaning. So in modifying literacies with the adjective transnational, we refer to the fact that our lives are becoming global in ways that are changing our experience of what it means to be a national subject. Such changes in how we live our nationality do not, as some fear, necessarily erode our sense of national belonging and obligation. They may deepen it. But we do recognize that what the nation means for individual people and communities and what it can mean in a globalizing world are shifting. Brazilians and Canadians experience and express our national and regional identities differently within our states and on the global scene. Nonetheless, both countries face challenges that educational systems are being asked to address from our different positions within the Americas and within the shifting global economic system we both participate in a global knowledge economy that is changing very quickly. So the nation's role in education is currently under pressure globally. Canada has a relatively well-educated population and a strong educational system but there are worries that Canada is falling behind globally. The biggest challenge for Canadians may be an unwarranted complacency, a reluctance amongst Anglophones to learn other languages, and relatively little internationalization in our educational system. Brazil's educational system 
ranks lower on global measurements. We know it needs to build capacity at all levels, and it also needs to internationalize. But Brazil is making significant investments in improving its system, and in many ways can be seen as ahead of Canada. So our project's designed in the belief that Canada and Brazil can learn from each other in how we are choosing to meet these challenges. Together, we hold the potential to co-create the kind of policy advice, pedagogical initiatives, and curricular reforms that will help our students learn for living successfully in our changing world. So transnational literacies combine hemispheric awareness and global consciousness with the development of performances suitable for full participation in the knowledge society. These literacies encompass the digital, multimodal, informational, visual, textual, and critical literacies associated with both traditional writing and reading skills and the range of new literacies now required. And our approach works through looking at the changing role of English globally and what it means to teach English in different local contexts each of which engages the global in its own distinctive ways. So Portuguese is of course the national language of Brazil, the language of everyday life and cultural expression, but in many places it's been joined by English in ways that make English itself a form of new and desirable literacy. There is a pressure to commoditize English. Many Brazilians feel pressure to learn English to participate in the global financial and knowledge economies. English seems to be the language of the neoliberal global economy and the global educational system. However, English can also enable the ability to imagine creative forms of resistance. Our project brings Brazilians and Canadians together to dislodge Brazilians and Canadians from their respective comfort zones and to encourage reciprocal learning about each other's cultures. This process could be called intercultural or cosmopolitan learning and it involves curricular changes to facilitate them. Curriculum must move beyond ethnocentric and presentist parameters to introduce students to deeper and broader dimensions of human achievements in the past and human potential for the future. So Michael Geist um, recently argued in the Canadian paper, The Taiyi, that the future model of education is already emerging. He says, the emerging model flips the current approach of expensive textbooks, closed research, and limited access to classroom-based learning on its head. Instead, featuring open course materials, open access to scholarly research, and internet-based courses that can accommodate many students simultaneously. The concern in Canada is that other countries are becoming first adapters while Canada lags behind. So why is it important to learn transnational literacies? Globalization is generating a variety of claims about education and global change. I'm going to skip a little bit here since I think I've talked a bit about transnational literacies already. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the contention that globalization is a struggle over knowledge of world affairs. It involves a struggle over how world affairs should be organized and whose interests they should serve. As Boaventura Sosa de Santos argues, there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. Education has always served as an instrument in the service of governing powers, but at the same time it has provided the potential to serve as a democratizing and emancipatory force. So we know that with the rise of neoliberalism, 
education's been marketized and redefined as a commodity to be sold by profit-seeking businesses. With the World Education Forum, our team believes another world is not only possible, but also necessary. And education has a role to play in imagining and realizing that better world, but to do so, education itself also needs to change. <clears throat> so I have a section on the global and local context for our work. Number one, education matters because globalization involves a struggle over knowledge of world affairs. And that struggle is reflected in the different ways in which education is currently understood. It's a mechanism both for facilitating social inclusion and meeting labor force needs. It's treated as both a public sector provision and a market sector growth area. There's confusion between its vocational and academic functions and disputes about which should be privileged. So number two, we believe that professional and technological education cannot be divorced from more academic analysis of history, culture, and society without endangering the sustainable development of humanity, the earth, and all earthly creatures. Number three, research production and dissemination are changing their character with the rise of digital technologies and the changing needs of globalizing societies. Within educational communities, learning communities are now being recognized as co-producers of knowledge. Number four, collaboration, complexity, and creativity are the key components of new learning cultures. And these prioritize learning, participation, and process over teaching, reception, and content. They valorize student autonomy. So in some ways these are to be welcomed, but in other ways, perhaps questioned, they certainly require more investigation. Number five, we're told we're entering a new economic era in which a knowledge economy is replacing an industrial economy. And in this era, students are renamed as consumers of the kind of education that can transform them into human capital or highly qualified personnel, HQP, as we call them in Canada. So student agency is limited to choosing which courses to follow in search of training that will make them employable. As the world economy globalizes and markets become more competitive, employability becomes a more serious concern. Under these conditions, training becomes the preferred word for how educators interact with our students. Six, insofar as training is seen as purely instrumentalist, it's been traditionally devalued in relation to learning and the search for knowledge. It is now being revalued. Seven, training in the protocols of an academic discipline is now being replaced by training in the kind of skills the job market values. In learning a discipline, students learn a form of academic literacy that designates their personal sense of the public readerships associated with that discipline. In our transitional moment, students still need to learn such specialized languages, but they also need to learn how to communicate across them. And I suggest national cultures work in a similar way. Therefore, establishing connections across these borders becomes a priority. Eight, given the widespread belief that interdisciplinarity is increasingly necessary to address the complexity of problems in an interdependent world, researchers and the decolonizing humanities need to address more carefully how to make interdisciplinary work for our emancipatory agendas. Nine, 
the tendency to think about training as a process that can be separated from humanistic forms of learning needs to be questioned. So does the tendency to separate teaching from research in public discourse about education. An understanding of the ways in which new learning cultures integrate learning, training, and research is going to be essential as the disciplines reinvent themselves to meet the challenges of an interdependent world. So why Canada and Brazil? Um, I'll just very briefly say that this is part of the regionalization turn in globalization studies. Um, agencies in both countries and globally have addressed, uh, have identified similar concerns so it's quite clear that we can learn from each other. I was told I had 40 minutes when I prepared this and I now have 20 so I'm cutting a few sections in order to uh, finish within my time. Uh, so why Global English from a critical perspective? Um, we recognize that today competence in the English language is necessary but not sufficient. All teaching of English today needs to recognize that we live in a world of polyglot nations in which multilingualism and multiculturalism have become a necessity for most world citizens. In this kind of context, cross-national partnerships such as ours have an important role to play in positioning our students for a networked age. Um, so I, I talk about the importance of globalizing the research imagination to seriously consider the epistemological and ontological implications of globalization for research and teaching in the humanities and social sciences. <coughs> so how do we engage the digital? Well, the summary of findings from the US-based Digital Youth Project in 2008 concluded that participation in the digital age means more than being able to access online information and culture. Youth could benefit from education being more open to forms of experimentation and social exploration that are generally not characteristic of educational institutions. And these authors conclude with a series of questions we too are asking. How can each partner take full advantage of the learning opportunities made available through new media? Redesign spaces of learning through developing revised forms of community, of partnerships and networks. And ensure that new literacies associated with new media are integrated creatively within critical and transnational literacy perspectives. New technologies offer potentially transformative possibilities for imagining connections across previously distant communities. Um, the in original enthusiasm about the potential of the internet is now giving way, however, to some concerns. A report in 2012 called Young Canadians in a Wired World, Phase 3, Teachers' Perspectives, was prepared for the Media Awareness Network, and it concluded that simple access to the internet has not made Canadian students better learners. Despite their facility with online tools, many students lack the skills they need to use these effectively for learning or to evaluate their authority or credibility. So the report raises five fa factors that teachers need to think about more carefully. Number one, teaching technology versus using technology to teach. The mistake the researchers and the teachers noted is that many teachers simply train students how to use technology 
something they already often know or can pick up very quickly, instead of providing them with learning opportunities that are enhanced through the use of these tools. <coughs> Number two, drill and kill experts versus facilitators and co-learners. Two different notions of the teacher's role in the classroom. Effective use of online tools involves teachers surrendering some control in the classroom, moving to share responsibility with students, to learn from students and with students, and to facilitate student learning through allowing greater diversity of exercises to go on at the same time. Number three, an interesting finding about different attitudes to technology between younger teachers and older teachers. Contrary to much common sense, these teachers noted that often older teachers have an advantage because they have developed better classroom management skills. Many teachers are wary of technology because it can be disruptive and network devices can distract students from the task at hand. Older students, sorry, older teachers have an advantage because of their greater experience in managing classroom dynamics. They're less afraid to experiment than some of the younger teachers. Four, technical training versus curricular training. Training tends to focus on how to use a particular piece of software rather than how to use technology to support learning objectives. So clearly we need more of the latter. Five, online filters versus letting students make mistakes. School filters or restrictions on access to network devices can make it difficult for students to advance learning through use of such platforms and learning from their mistakes. In Canada, education is very decentralized, so each school or school district makes its own decisions about whether to allow access to the internet or to certain programs for teachers to use. This report suggests that teachers should have that access because students need to be taught how to navigate the dangerous online environment. So I'm already moving into my conclusions. <coughs> to the extent that globalization is a struggle over knowledge of world affairs, we live at a time of contending rhetorics and a proliferation of literacies through which to understand them. For example, the opening address at the Canadian Digital Media Network Canada 3.0 Digital Media Forum by Canada's Governor General, delivered in Brazil in April of this year, employs a rhetoric currently popular in business and government circles. The speech praises the communicative revolution heralded by the rise of the internet stresses the importance of learning and innovating across borders, expresses the belief that this new technology is very democratic in nature, advances a call to practice a sort of digital diplomacy of knowledge, and asserts that Canada and Brazil are poised to thrive in an age where knowledge, rather than GDP or military might, is gaining momentum as the new global currency. Well, each of these statements is broadly accepted as a new form of common sense, and each holds some truth, yet each is also questionable. New forms of digital literacy are needed, not just to access the quality of information provided through the net, but also to analyze more carefully the claims made about how the net operates, how it is governed, whose interests it serves, and the implications of these for knowledge production and sharing and for creating sustainable futures. The slippage that equates digital engagements with knowledge itself and then describes knowledge as a new form of currency needs to be questioned. 
So the new knowledge economy is not living up to its early promise of translating education into stable and well-paying jobs. Vocational education and training is set in a turbulent and volatile environment marked by national and regional specificities in which its definition is somewhat fluid. Emancipatory goals for vocational education and training are constrained by its relationship to other forms of education as well as the ways in which it is lodged within capitalist and neoliberal relations. And these take different forms within different locales. To move beyond instrumentalism and discourses of human capital, we need to break from past approaches, moving beyond ethnocentrism and curricular choices, and encouraging student mobility and language learning. Teachers cannot be seen as the implementers of policy produced elsewhere. That is one of our fundamental principles. Teachers need to be involved in designing changes, encouraging student autonomy, and opening their classrooms to the world. As Brian Morgan argues in a book co-edited by one of our team members, Huberval Franco Machiel, Formación de Profesores de Linguas, Ampliando Perspectivas, Improvisation should be an important feature of 21st century classrooms, allowing the learning to be reciprocal with teachers and students learning from each other and students learning from each other as well. Morgan stresses how identities are both revealed and created in the classroom. Machiel and Vanessa Daassi Arojo, the editors of the volume, stress that teachers need to be involved in setting curricular policy. They cannot be mere executors of a policy designed by others in other contexts. Current divisions of responsibility and labor between scholars and teachers need to change. Tensions between autonomy and imposition need to be better negotiated. Changing tools does not necessarily change structures. Machiel also refers to reform fatigue as a result of political imperatives influencing educational policy in inappropriate ways. And he quotes Kress to ask, which culture or cultures are to be the points of reference for a global curriculum? Whose power? Whose authority? In what domains? How exercised? So addressing these questions requires negotiation between local and national actors, teachers, academics, and policy makers together to revise the systems within which we work. The framework for such decision making, for now, should probably be pluriversal rather than universal, at least until new forms of shared understanding can be created on a more equal basis. So our project is a first small step toward that goal. <laughs>